Welcome to Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee, a weekly program exploring important trends in health. Since publication of the 2001 Surgeon General's report, childhood obesity has become a front and center public health priority. Everyone from the CDC to the Institute of Medicine to the AMA to this program has weighed in on the subject. Numbers, dollars, lives, disease, and disability, all have been impacted, and all have been studied and projected in excruciating detail. For the public at large, it's difficult not to notice the increasing numbers of large and extra-large children all around us. These images are quite common, and they're quite disturbing. The situation begs the question, why can't we get a handle on the problem and solve it? We don't have the exact answer, but it's clear that addressing this problem at its source is a remarkably complex task. Not only are we dealing with a nationwide diet that is unhealthy, both in quantity and in quality, but one that is skillfully promoted to an underinformed and underactive population. Food labeling and advertising, both under federal control, play a much larger role in the obesity epidemic than many realize or are willing to admit. In fact, food in the government, that is the Federal Trade Commission and the Food and Drug Administration, have a troublesome legal history that relates directly to the challenges we're facing with childhood obesity today. But before we focus on these issues with the FTC and the FDA, let's look at a few facts. American children are exposed to some 40,000 food advertisements per year, with 72% of them promoting cereal, fast food, or candy. Studies show these ads to be effective. That is, they shape the product preferences of the children as well as their eating habits. And going to school doesn't provide much relief. About 60% of U.S. middle schools continue to sell soft drinks from vending machines, and the meals being served in the majority of our schools exceed the federal limits on total and saturated fats. Add to these examples the fact that only 28% of U.S. high school students are involved in daily physical education classes, and it's easy to see why nutritionists describe our nation's schools as toxic environments. If there's any good news here, it's that states are on to the issue and are increasingly becoming legislative laboratories when it comes to challenging childhood obesity. Since 1998, more than 100 state legislative initiatives to increase requirements and funding of physical education in schools have been introduced, enacted, or are pending. There have been nearly 60 legislative proposals to restrict school vending machines, not to mention the Clinton Foundation's recent successful negotiations with the soft drink industry that will lead to the elimination of high-calorie sodas from schools. Obesity task forces are forming in nearly every state. And if you'd like to see improvements to walking or biking trails in your community, or more focus on workplace fitness, it's more than likely that someone in your state is or soon will be writing a law about it. But despite these positive steps at the state level, a variety of legal and political barriers hinder more widespread adoption of these initiatives. To better understand this, it's important to become familiar with the history behind the relationship between the Federal Trade Commission, the Food and Drug Administration, and food itself. Now, the FTC has primary authority over food advertising, and the FDA regulates food labeling. When looking at advertising, the FTC focuses on ads that are either unfair or deceptive. Unfair ads would be those that, quote, may cause substantial, unavoidable injury to consumers that is not outweighed by offsetting consumer or competitive benefit, close quotes. And advertising is considered deceptive if it is, quotes, likely to mislead consumers in a way that is material, close quotes. In 1978, the FTC waded into regulating child-oriented advertising, and it wasn't a pretty sight. The public wasn't sure it wanted a national nanny, and the food, toy, and entertainment industries went ballistic. Together, they raised $16 million to fight regulation. Congress was extremely receptive and for a time suspended all funding for the FTC to send a clear message that they had treaded into a political hornet's nest. 
The next problem was more concrete. Regulators could not find a way to tailor the rules to meet their narrow objective. It was surprisingly difficult to prove that young children make up the majority of any television program's audience. From a legal standpoint, the term children's programming was elusive. And in the end, clear evidence that tied the ads to poor nutrition was lacking. The FTC then acquiesced, giving up the fight, but only after documenting their findings and recommendations, a message in the bottle, if you will, for future generations. Today, the FTC is empowered to go after food advertising only if it is deceptive. A working definition of children's television programming has been defined by the Children's Television Act. And studies have found that children who watch more TV are less likely to be able to identify which of two foods is healthier. Studies have also found that about half of all nutrition-related information in television advertisements is misleading or inaccurate. Put it all together and we have 30 more years of studies tying television to nutrition habits and preferences that promote childhood obesity. But all that said, the legal case remains difficult to prove and the opposition, well, it's broad and well-funded. Our modern FTC's approach to advertising quotes favors requiring more information over banning information and avoids broad restrictions limiting both deceptive and non-deceptive speech, close quotes. Said in another way, choosing freely is deeply rooted in our consumer culture. Now, how about the FDA? Well, its authority comes from the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act which requires that food labels be truthful and not misleading. In 1973, the FDA began to expand its involvement in this arena. By 1994, nutrition fact labels were required on most food products to provide information on sodium, carbohydrate, sugar, fat, and cholesterol. In 2003, trans fat content was added, and by 2005, they were looking at calories and making sure that serving size information was accurate. They also wanted to extend labeling to restaurant meals, but buckled when they faced stiff political backwinds. The FDA benefits by being on the right side of the free speech argument, that is, more information, while the FTC, by regulating advertising, is rather easily positioned to appear to be limiting speech. The result? As public consensus grows that childhood obesity must be confronted, and our governmental bodies are unable to completely respond to the critical circumstances, the courts have become more active. But as has been seen in several highly publicized suits against fast food giants like McDonald's, this is no easy ride. For one thing, the First Amendment protects commercial speech. This is information that is related solely to the economic interests of the person or group speaking, no matter how low the information's value, because it still might carry information that's important to the public. Therefore, if you were pursuing restrictions, you'd have to prove that the proposed actions would lower childhood obesity and do so without unduly restricting information flow to adults. You'd also have to show the rationale behind placing restrictions on some products and not others. What can we take away from this brief history of our past legal attempts to combat obesity? In general, I think it's now clear that pragmatic moves in the areas of least resistance are proving to be the best course. First, even though obesity is an age-wide epidemic, we should focus on children and adolescents. As we've seen with tobacco, public sentiment rises faster and higher when children are involved. Second, we must support states as legislative laboratories. They can test and prove out winning approaches for sound nutritional legislation. Third, since fighting food ads involves significant obstacles, how about counter-advertising, as was successfully done in the anti-smoking campaigns? Fourth, Let's approach nutrition leaders in the food industry to advance self-regulation and fight childhood obesity as part of their social responsibility platforms. And finally, we need greater public education on food choices. The less we know, the more vulnerable we are to deceptive advertising. For Health Politics, 
I'm Mike McGee. Thank you for watching Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee. If you're accessing Health Politics with a portable device, please visit our homepage, healthpolitics.org, for more information on this topic and many others. If you're watching